This is Tincho, Ethereum security researcher, previous lead auditor at Opens Up, and creator of Damn Vulnerable DeFi. And today we have the pleasure of talking with Tincho, going over his auditing process so that you can learn how to make damn unvulnerable DeFi. To do this, we're going to be doing a live mock audit of the Ethereum name service GitHub, seeing exactly some of the tools and techniques that Tinchel would use to audit this. I don't have a super formal auditing process. I really think that everybody will find their own ways. I will just show you briefly some things that I do today. Link to the full interview in the description. Let's get froggy. So this is a repository for ENS. The first thing that I would do is obviously go to a repository, you would clone the repository to my local environment. But if you are like very unfamiliar, you should probably go to the documentation, at least I know, read the introduction. Now he says there's no formal audit process, but this sounds like a good step one. Download the code, read the documentation. Read the fucking documentation. Here we have the architecture is telling us like already some keywords that we will need to understand at some point, such as what a registry is, what a resolver is. Already I will get familiar with this. Probably these are contracts that I'm about to see in the code and so on and so forth. One thing that you can do also after reading some documentation is looking at audit reports. If we go to the actual code, we will realize that there are lots of things. Wait a minute. What the heck is that logo? What wonky text editor is Tencho using? That, my friends, would be VS Codium. It's different from VS Code. VS Code is a product owned by Microsoft that actually sends a lot of your usage information over to Microsoft. VS Codium doesn't do this. They have removed, I think, telemetry and some things related to Microsoft. Tencho said he's just been trying it out recently, but maybe it's a security alpha leak. Um, so multiple contracts in here. Already we see that lots of folders. It's using hard hat from what I can tell. These days I like projects that use Foundry more than those that use hard hat. So in that case, what I would do is I created another folder in which I have a Foundry local setup. Why do you like Foundry better? Why do you make this Foundry local setup? It's faster and I can write quick tests only using Solidity. So I will do whatever thing that I want to do here, but just an easy way to have something quick and dirty to test things quickly. Bring and use the tools that you're most familiar and best with. I think that's super important. And don't be afraid to bring your disgustingly horrible, dirty, dirty tests. But anyway, already we saw that it's quite complex. So what I would do in this case is there is a command line utility that I would use, which is called CLOG. CLOG will help you count lines of code. And so I would use CLOG. It would give me a nice output that you can actually parse to a CSV. And instead of doing this here, what I would usually do is I would move that to a spreadsheet. That I have the scope for ENS, right? All these files are now ordered here. And now I can have a better view in terms of how many files do I have, how complex they might be. So apparently I have 59 files and now I know the name wrapper will be one of the most complex contracts perhaps, right? Because it has more than 700 lines of code. Another approach to do this scoping phase, you can actually use this tool by consensus, which is called Solidity Metric. So you can run it on a project and it will actually give you a nice report of the code base and at its level of complexity. And then I have a column stating where the thing that I'm doing is not started, it's in progress or it's done. So this is his next step. He either uses Solidity Metrics or C-Lock, ranks other contracts that he needs to audit based on complexity and starts going through it, moving contracts from not started to in progress to done. A very organized approach. When you do this alone, it might seem silly, but when you work in teams, it's quite important. As the audit progresses, I will be less and less focused on this file because probably this is super complex and will be related to either. But most of all, it's very useful, at least for me at the beginning of the audit, just to understand what am I looking at. Once I have this table, I, think I usually start with the little Legos and then I go move up in complexity. So in this case, I will probably, I don't know, start with the ERC20 recoverable contract. Here it is. And it's quite short. Say, okay, so inheriting from open sampling as an auditor probably I can take that for granted which is out of the scope and I will assume that's working correctly and it has a single function to recover funds okay it has access control so this is probably fine as long as they are handling access and controls in the right way this is fine and it's actually doing this right so we start with the small little building blocks or Legos, as Tincho said. And now you're going to see Tincho's brain start switching into, how can I break this? 
as an auditor, you might start wondering where this is good for any token out there, right? Where it's possible to actually execute a transfer on any address that the owner passes here and where that could be problematic for ill-behaved ERC-20 tokens. And if you're familiar with USDT, for example, that could be problematic in this. Ah, now we're seeing him drawing on his expertise, knowing that USDT is a weird token. USDT actually doesn't return a boolean on its transfer firms, whereas a lot of other tokens actually do. What the fuck, USDT? When you see that only owner function, do you think, okay, is this a DAO? Is there a single person who controls? What are your thoughts? At least at the beginning, I wouldn't worry about it too much. At some point, I will read documentation about the roles of this. But yeah, at some point, I should probably understand at some point who's the actual owner. Okay, let's say that you think that this is okay. So what I would do usually is I would take notes in the code, right? So in this case, I would say like access control, okay. For example, just to have a note saying that I was here. Or you can have a question like Patrick said, is this governance, right? And let's say this was an issue. So I would do this. Shouldn't be, I don't know, let's say shouldn't be owner. Another thing that I do to take notes is actually have notes files in the same place. Very raw notes, very having a file where I can quickly dump ideas that I have. At some point, things don't go well. I would have an issues list here. And I will start listing, I don't know, in line, blah, 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 or file, blah, 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 list issues. Take notes in the code in a notes file somewhere. Just have a place where you can dump thoughts. Maybe you can even use a note-taking plugin. I don't use any plugins. That's because I don't like having the UI clutter too much with stuff. Yeah, I, a note-taking extension was a dumb idea. And one thing that you have to be careful when you start with the very little things, so it's very easy to go deep into the rabbit hole of the single thing that you are trying to audit. Is that, for example, I have very little knowledge of DNS. I'm not like super familiar with it. And I got like very like down into DNS because I was just paying attention to this single resolver. And that led me to realize that after, I know, two days, I was growing familiar with DNS, but I was losing the big picture of actually hey, I'm actually auditing ENS. So it's very easy to go deep into the rabbit hole of the single thing that you are trying to audit. Remember to jump out of the rabbit holes. Perfect. So at some points in during the audit, you will realize that you might need to test things. So in this case, I saw these two functions. One is going from my bytes thing, actually returning an address, and the other is doing the other way around. You might say it's okay, but if you're lazy, you can actually use Foundry to help you in that. So what I did in this case, I used my very handy hacky boundary repo that I have in here. And I actually copied these two functions to a contract. Like I just took them, not even trying to do fancy imports or whatever, just raw copying and pasting them here. And I did a quick test, a fast test in which I provide an address. I pass that address to this first function and the result of that, I pass it to the other function. And I want to make sure that I always get the same address as a result. A lot of times, yes, you're going to write code and not just do manual reviews. Tensho here wrote what's called a fuzz test, which you should absolutely smash that like button because we're going to have a video on that sometime in the future. Use your tools to validate findings that you have an inkling are wrong. In the cases where I have to set up more complex stuff, perhaps having a separate folder with a single project is not that convenient because I would need to set up the whole DNS system. And that wouldn't be that convenient. So in those cases, I would go to the actual testing environment of the project. If you're doing a private audit, how important is the process of, it, of talking and interacting and, and keeping communications with the client open? I would say it's almost fundamental. Usually developers will have much more context than you as an auditor on what the system is intending to do. So you can spend a whole week trying to figure out on your own where this modifier should be in this function or not. But if you actually send a question to the client and tell them, hey, should this be here or not? And they will tell you, yes, this should be here. You can see it in test, blah, blah, blah. You can see them as companions during the audit and you should rely on them. You can rely on the client. AO hey, protocol, is your code good? You think so? <laughs> Hell yeah, my work is done. Having said that, it's also important not to trust too much. At the end of the day, they are trusting you as the expert. So in this, in that sense, I would advise, okay, keep the clients at hand, ask questions, but also be detached enough. Since they built the code, they have spent more time thinking about the code and looking at the code 
than you ever will. Ask them questions and don't be afraid to ask questions. I guess at this point, what's the next step? Are we wrapping up now? Are we writing the report up? What do we do next? The thing is, I always get the feeling that you can be looking at a system forever. It, there's always one additional line that you can check. There's always one additional attack that you can think of, one additional potential cause, my vulnerability and everything. So what I do is I time bound myself. To have a certain level of confidence when you're shipping the report that you did your best and you thought of every single possible attack or vulnerability that you could think of in that limited amount of time. Time bound yourself. When you're going through this code, how are you thinking of different attacks? Like when you're looking at a piece of code, how do you get that context of what different types of attacks to think of? Yeah, I don't have a checklist. Very difficult to translate experience in doing it. Have this adversarial mindset or try to at least. There's lots of knowledge that can come from oh, every single day reading vulnerability reports, every single day doing, or reading responsible disclosures that are published reading all these reports, I've read newsletters, like, I don't know, I have this constant influx of security-related information to Solidity that little by little, I think you start growing the intuitions, the experience that actually help you identify quickly things that can happen in smart contracts. And always remember that you can miss things. There's no perfect auditor. I think that everybody has audited sufficient enough and complex enough systems. They have all missed issues. And it's okay. Security is a, it's a thing that we have to approach from many different angles. And auditing is just one thing that must be done, but it's not the only one. Knowing that you're doing your best, in that knowing that you're putting your best effort, every day growing your skills, learning, grows an intuition and experience in you. Something that I always say is to audit, to me is 50% finding vulnerabilities and 50% delivering readable report. Once the client starts fixing the issues, they will send you the fixes for the issues. And what you have to do at that point is actually review the fixes and make sure that not only the vulnerability that you highlighted in the report is fixed, but actually this has been introduced by the fix. And then you wrap up your whole auditing process with writing a very good report and take the time to do so. Once you give them the report, they will go ahead and fix the issues, come back, say, hey, we fixed them. And then it's your job to make sure that they fix the issues and they didn't reintroduce new bugs. Let's say you give your audit report, you've done your time box, you've done as much as you can, you think you did a good job. Four months goes by, oh my God, $100 million hack. They've ended up on wrecked. What do you do? What happens? Let me approach it slowly, okay? So sure. I will first say, I have always been of the idea a security code review should be valuable enough beyond the fact that I find or not find a critical issue. So I should be able to provide value to whoever is working with me, to whoever is trusting me, beyond the fact that I did or did not find a critical issue. Obviously, the less critical issues that you miss, the better, the safer, and perhaps they miss something. And that can happen and has happened and will continue to happen. But it's naive to think, in my opinion, that just because an auditor missed something, the whole blame of thing is on the audit. This, I think, is a really important final thought. You as an auditor, it is not solely your job to make sure their code is bug free. You share that responsibility with the client. However, this doesn't give you free range to suck at your job. People will notice. Tincho, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all you've done for the Web3 community. And I'm sure everyone will get a lot from this. Okay, Patrick, thank you for inviting me. Bye. Bye.